Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, apologies that we're uh, a minute late joining you. Um, so we have two speakers today at the UK ICN uh, seminar series, um, both from the MHRP, uh, the Medical Medicines and Healthcare Product Regulatory Agency, formerly known as NIBS, um, at South MIMS Laboratories. We've just got a few technical issues with uh, JADA at the moment. So we're going to switch it, the program around and we're going to hear from Dr. Neil Almond um, from, from this laboratory. He's been working at NIBS and now the MHRA, South MIMS Lab, since 1988 when he was appointed with short-term funding from the MRC's AIDS-directed program. He worked on and subsequently led the program to develop and apply simian models of HIV and AIDS to establish a scientific framework for the development of safe and effective vaccines for HIV and AIDS. Over the past 10 years, with the emergence and re-emergence of new viruses, he has worked with colleagues at MHRA SML, UK HSA and DSTL to establish models of infection, to establish the role of serological responses in protection, to inform vaccine development, including for viruses such as Zika, um, chikungunya, and most recently SARS-CoV-2, which will be the focus of his talk today. So uh, thanks, Neil, and I'll hand over to you. Okay, cheers. Thank you very much, Lorraine. Uh, I'll just shift over, hopefully share the screen. I hope you can see that. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk uh, about some of our work. Uh, the talk out today is work that I've undertaken with colleague Sarah Kempster uh, and Debbie Ferguson at uh, uh, South Mims Labs. Um, so first of all, uh, as, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues, uh, past and present uh, at the MHRA, uh, particularly uh, Neil Berry, uh, and uh, also uh, with regards to the SARS-CoV-2, uh, Jan, Matt and Sarah, who prepared a lot of the virus stocks. And as you'll hear later from Jada uh, and Mark Page and, and Emma about the de development of serological reference materials. But this work that I'll be describing has also been undertaken in collaboration with colleagues at the Royal Vet College, uh, UK HSA labs down at Porton Down uh, and also the University of Oxford. So um, the framework in which I, uh, that I'd like to talk about the work today is part of the program at uh, the uh, South Mims Labs, which we describe as regulatory research into emerging diseases. And this is research which is designed to facilitate regulatory approval of biologicals and diagnostics. It's designed to be product agnostic, but helps to guide developers, manufacturers and regulators understand the, the, frame, the scientific framework for the development of these biological medicines and associated diagnostics. Examples of the work that we undertake is comparative pathogenesis of, uh, of uh, models of infection and disease, which may be used by, in, in regulatory applications. Establishing uh, correlates and mechanisms of, protect, of immunological protection, which would then help to guide uh, what may be required of, of, of an effective vaccine. Uh, and and um, robust quantification of these correlates using uh, physical biological standards of the type which uh, Jada will tell you about uh, in the second talk today. To undertake this work, we have access at South Mims to uh, specialist facilities, high containment at CL3 and SAPO4. Uh, animal models that can be held under these conditions are pictured on the right, and these include non human primates. Uh, and we're also really interested in robust, reproducible measurement of uh, the protection we observe. And we collaborate with a wide variety of external organizations. So since the emergence of Ebola in uh, 2014, we have been undertaking a program of developing serological reference materials uh, shown in this table against high priority pathogens identified by the WHO and the UK's vaccine network. And seeing, uh, and as you can see in this uh, table, there are a number of these reference materials which we have completed work on producing the materials are highlighted in green, ones which were undertaking work highlighted in yellow, uh, and, and some uh, areas which we're uh, still uh, initiating this work. 
But in addition to the development of the reference materials, uh, as Giada will describe, we've also been doing a number of studies in, in, with it within the work of uh, that I'm particularly interested in, in trying to understand whether these phys uh, serological reference materials actually uh, confer protection in appropriate animal models. And this work has been that which we've uh, been able to acquire, innovate, uh, and, and other external funding, uh, as well as NA NIHR, uh, and some from CEPI. And we collaborate with colleagues at uh, uh, Port and Down Labs, both DSTL and UKHSA. But in addition to the initial list, of course, um, then uh, we were also designed uh, to be establishing the, the framework for de developing uh, standards and uh, models for disease X as they appeared. And of course, SARS-CoV-2 is one of the significant disease Xs which has occurred since 2014. So at the South Mims Labs, uh, and with CEPI funding and collaboration with UK HSA colleagues, we've been developing large scale stocks of SARS-CoV-2 as the virus isolates have evolved through the pandemic. And uh, these stocks have been prepared by through short term culture and extensively uh, sequence characterized and stocks of the of, uh, listed down there and continue to be developed uh, with uh, the external funding. Um, and are available and samples of these stocks are available from uh, through the NIBSC catalog online. And to, uh, to me, the availability of these large scale stocks, which means that people can undertake studies in different labs with identical material, which I think is always interesting for comparing the outcome uh, in the different models that may be or, or different studies that are being undertaken. In our studies, we've been using the hamster model to evaluate the comparative path uh, pathogenesis of uh, variants of concerns using a common study plan. We're using a relatively low volume of material by giving a dose of about 5 times 10 to the 4 TCD50 by the intranasal route. And uh, groups of animals have been sacrificed at day 4, day 10 and day 28 to look at uh, the pathology in tissues at these three points, the peak of viremia, uh, clear, just after clearance of viremia and long term, uh, uh, longer term pathogenesis, as well as multiple uh, sampling from the uh, upper respiratory tract to provide better understanding of the uh, course of the uh, uh, RNAmia or viremia. So uh, when we compare uh, the Wuhan strain, or VIC-1, the stock that we've got, with Alpha, Beta, and Delta. Uh, as you can see here, in males and female hamsters, you get very similar uh, kinetics of uh, detectable RNA in the upper respiratory tract, taken from a, a mouth and uh, uh, primarily a mouth swab. And these data are presented in international units so that uh, we can compare the uh, uh, the PCR response has been detected in, in these samples. But like many other groups have reported, uh, the pathology of uh, alpha, beta and delta uh, has been showing a general decrease in the degree of pathology that it causes. In, in hamsters, of course, there's this uh, uh, well-characterized loss of weight, uh, often exceeding 10 to 15 percent, uh, and with, with Vic VIC-1, it was closer to 20%, but in these studies where we have comparative uh, analysis, because we've been using the same uh, method of, of an, uh, uh, anaesthetist or sedation, uh, where we feel more confident about the comparative data with alpha, beta, and delta, you can still see that there is less weight loss uh, with the uh, variants as they've been developing. And this correlates at uh, pathology, particularly at day 10, where you can see that uh, with the Delta virus, uh, there are fewer orange and red boxes measured by our veterinary pathologists looking at these samples uh, blinded uh, at the Royal Vet College. Uh, and, and so uh, both the weight loss in the hamster model uh, correlates with the lung pathology or the degree of lung pathology that we're seeing at day 10. And this can be uh, correlates with both the macropathology and detection of uh, 
virus expression, either nuclear protein or spike protein by immunohistochemistry. And as you can see in the macropath macropathology, the degree of uh, blue uh, hematoxylin staining is an indication of the amount of uh, in infiltration and inflammation in the lungs. Uh, and that decreases as we go from B, uh, alpha, beta to delta. One of the interesting things we wanted to do was to do a titration of our alpha and beta stocks. And in both cases, the in vivo titer of these viruses exceed that of the in vitro titer on the same cells on which the uh, virus stock was prepared. But if you look at the uh, pathology, uh, both by weight loss and secondly, by the degree of lung pathology, as you go down the titer, there's no titration of weight loss. What happens there is there's, that uh, you get similar levels of pathology, irrespective of whether you challenge with 10 to the 4 or 1 infectious unit. Uh, and, and, and the impact on weight loss, uh, the mean weight loss, is only uh, influenced by groups where you have some animals infected and others not because we're at one TCD50. So the kit, um, so the conclusion so far is using our low volume atraumatic um, model of inoculation of virus initiates infection and significant lung pathology. The alpha, beta and delta variants have similar upper respiratory tract RNemia, but different lower respiratory tract pathology. The in vivo titers of the stock exceed the in vitro titers but the lung pathology at day 10 is not initial dose dependent. Uh, so it indicates that it is a subsequent uh, expansion of the virus in the upper respiratory tract is probably what's driving the amount of pathology seen at day 10, particularly. Well, what I want to go, go on to is some of our work and looking at antibodies as a correlate and a mechanism of vaccine protection. As we're well aware, both innate and adaptive immunity controls and clears primary infection with many pathogens through intracellular responses, cytokine interferon, and adaptive cellular and uh, serological responses. But if we're thinking about development of vaccines and, uh, and, and optimizing vaccines, then we need to understand what responses are critical in conferring the enhanced protection against primary pathology when we are re-exposed to the same a similar pathogen. And these are needed uh, to be generated by an effective vaccine and, of course, also need to be measured by an appropriate prognostic assay to assess the need of populations for boosting. Now, serological responses have uh, are, uh, frequently been uh, established throughout history as a correlate and mechanism protection. And this is for an, a number of reasons. One is that we can robustly measure protection in serological assays. Uh, using assays which are calibrated by physical standards, uh, such as the international standards, which we'll hear about from Jada later. But secondly, uh, over the years, serum transfer studies uh, in man and animal models have demonstrated a central role of serological responses alone to protect against uh, pathology, even if they don't protect against uh, infection with the relevant pathogen. But the real question is, how do protective antibodies in work? And do, does it correlate with the in vitro functional assays that we may be using to assess the uh, potency of the serological uh, material that we may be uh, transferring or wishing to generate? So we have been using, uh, uh, studying the role of human immune serum to protect uh, in the hamster model that we've established. So in the first studies, we obtained a pool of human convalescent serum uh, from uh, uh, Andy Pollard and, uh, and Tessa Lamb at the University of Oxford. And we uh, have used that same pool of uh, serum to uh, transfer into groups of hamsters prior to exposure with either VIC-1, uh, alpha or beta viruses. And as you can see in these graphs, looking at changes in weight in the hamsters following subsequent uh, challenge 24 hours later with the relevant virus, uh, you can see that uh, compared with controls, uh, that uh, the uh, administration of convalescent plasma at 10 mils per kg into the hamsters 24 hours before challenge significantly uh, controls the weight loss 
uh, that we see in the hamsters. Uh, with VIC-1 at 10 mils per kg, there appeared to be no uh, weight loss in these animals. Uh, and with in the alpha and the beta viruses, we did a more ex uh, extensive study where we titrated the amount of convalescent plasma transferred. And as you can see, as we go down to one mil or uh, 0.1 mils per kg, there's an increasing amount of weight loss observed in those groups of hamsters compared to those given 10 mils, where there is definitely uh, a flat lining. Now, of course, this gets increasingly challenging to establish as we have inc uh, in less pathogenic challenge viruses, uh, but, but clearly we can see significant differences between the 10 mils per kg uh, and, and, uh, and the uh, uninfected and the untransferred con uh, control infected animals, uh, particularly at day seven and day eight. And this correlates with the uh, uh, amount of pathology that we see in the lungs. Uh, and here we show a heat map on the left hand side of the uh, veterinary pathology scores uh, and, and on the right hand side more visually uh, studies of the uh, macropathology and uh, the uh, immunohistochemistry of the amount of virus replicating in lung tissues. Wherever we're looking at the immunohistochemistry this will be an area of uh, cellular infiltrate which is where we find the virus replicating cells to be located. But as you can see here, there is titratable uh, degrees of pathology as we go down from 10 mils per kg down to uh, 0.1 mil per kg in our alpha and beta challenge groups of hamsters. And all of this is occurring in uh, where the amount of transferred serum that we have administered here has no effect on the amount of virus replication in the upper respiratory tract at the same time. So the serological effect is primarily on pathology, not affecting the uh, ability of the virus to initiate an upper respiratory tract infection. And, and the kinetics of that appears to be unaffected. But that was convalescent serum. And what we're really interested in now, of course, in the population which is largely being vaccinated, is what is the power of the vaccine serum that is generated and, and what, do what do we need with vaccines here? To do that, we created two serum pools, uh, one which was pre-boost from individuals that we knew had not been infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 prior, uh, prior to vaccination or up to the day where we collected the uh, samples. Uh, and that was after two uh, doses of vaccine and then a post boost pool which was collected after uh, they had received a third boost of uh, uh, either Pfizer or AZ vaccines at the time. Once again known by their anti-N response to be clear from being infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 at all. And as you can see here there's been a, in this micronute assay there's been a significant uh, boosting of the neutralizing antibody responses in these uh, pre-boost versus post-boost uh, measured against both Delta and Omicron viruses. And the figures here show that it's been a marked increase in the titers from the boosting effect against both of these viruses. And what we've done with that using the more recent variants of challenge is to use this pre-boost and post-boost serum to look and see whether uh, transfer of this serum prior to challenge will transfer protection against pathology. And as you can see with the, in the left hand panel with Delta virus in the middle panel with the initial Omicron variant and on the right hand panel the more recent derivative of these viruses, the pre-transfer -trans of immune serum appears to uh, reduce the impact, the pathology impact on the hamsters of, uh, uh, of the relevant variant uh, uh, being affected. And once again, this appears to be a titratable effect that if you dilute the serum, then you lose the benefit. This most clearly shown in the Delta where we did the most extensive study, but we have a, 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 a more difficult situation with XBB 1.5 possibly because of the uh, lower degree of pathology that we see in our control infected animals. Um, when we look in the lung pathology, and here we're using the heat maps to give us a clue about what's going on, you can see with uh, that the impact of 
the uh, uh, pre-treatment with immune serum, there is titration of some effects, but this seems to be a less clear cut and certainly is less clear cut in the Omicron and the XBB uh, 1.5. And there may even be some hints that there are some factors in the groups, the relatively small groups of animals we've done so far, where the immune serum may well having some impact on some aspects of pathology in the lung. For example, uh, the alveolar inflammation there uh, with the pre-boost, the undiluted pre-boost, which may indicate that uh, that it, it, where we have these complex polyclonal sera, that there may be a mixture of antibodies uh, in, in uh, operation, which may have a more uh, a mixture of beneficial and less beneficial uh, aspects of uh, on uh, protecting the lung pathology. So, in the final conclusions that uh, we have shown in this hamster model, the transfer of both human convalescent or vaccine-induced sera, they do not prevent infection of the upper respiratory tract at the doses we've administered to date. And don't forget that maximum dose is 10 mils per kg. We can't replace all of the uh, serum of a hamster with human immune serum uh, prior to challenge, but there's a significant dose has been administered, which is probably about a one in eight dilution of the, uh, the, the concentration in the uh, recipient animals compared to that in the pool. This can protect against pathology in the hamsters, uh, both lung uh, pathology and the weight loss, which of course is a, uh, a symptomatic uh, pathology of this particular model. And also we can seem to protect against pathology against viruses where there may be little or no, no reported cross neutralization. And uh, so the, the uh, the, the, the issue here might be that the protection observed following tr serum transfer may not be appearing to be operating through neutralization of incoming virus and questions whether virus neutralization represents perhaps the most effective measure or appropriate me measure for uh, measuring the antibodies that protect against lung pathology. <coughs> Excuse me. Because protection is against disease, not infection. And if we're not measuring the right protective antibody, then we may well be getting incorrect information about what is required uh, with our vaccines to establish the breadth of vaccine protection against the variants of concern as they emerge. And we believe that further work is needed to identify better assays for measuring protective antibodies and help us to guide further development of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Thank you very much for your attention.